Okay. Um, all right. Well, look, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm, I'm Roger. I'm a director here at Lewis Football Club, um, part of the board. Uh, I'm an owner too. Um, I'm Simon's with us. Simon Parker, ladies manager. And I was thinking, um, yeah, what we want to do is, is have a good old question and answer session. So try and have as much time for, for that as possible. But maybe if we kick off with um, me just asking Simon a couple of questions, because we haven't talked for a couple of days. Uh, and, um, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll throw it open to the floor. Um, if I could ask, if you could just mute whilst, um, we're, whilst we're gassing or whilst you're not gassing. And then when, when, we, do the, uh, when we do the questions, then uh, I think there's, there's only a few of us, so we might just be able to shout out. Um, but also we have the, um, the instant messaging here on Zoom. So if you, always, if you wanted to ask a question via the uh, messaging function, you can always do that and I'll, I'll keep tabs on it. Uh, how's that sound? Sounds good. Okay, cool. Um, so, hey, Sai, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. All right, yeah. thanks, thanks for this evening. Really appreciate it. I'm sure everyone does. Um, yeah, so how, how are things? It's, um, football's not the kind of job you can do over Zoom very easily, is it? No, not really. Um, essentially, it's just, I guess, a lot of reviewing and planning at the moment. Um, yeah, obviously, not really a lot of coaching happening. Oh. What kind of stuff are you doing? Because we're in this kind of pause mode, right? And it's difficult for all of us, but um, especially you, right? And, and, and the guys. Um, what, what kind of work can you do? Whilst you, what's it like as a manager on, on lockdown? Well, like, um, so for now, so I'm doing a lot of reviews. So just reviewing the games that we've already played. Um, mm -hmm. Trying to get a little bit more focused um, kind of individual feedback on the players as well. So... Obviously, before I was the assistant, and now I've kind of stepped in, and I'm the manager. So I've I've got the freedom to maybe implement a few changes, whether it's tactically or anything along those lines. So, obviously, where we were with the league, I didn't really want to make a lot of changes, um, and it was more about obviously trying to avoid relegation as well as picking up points and going up the table. So, didn't want to make too many changes. Just wanted to you know make everything quite solid and then build from that base. But obviously, with this break. I had kind of time to look at maybe things that I would like to do going forward. Um, and helping with that is obviously looking at the players more in depth by reviewing them, um, seeing things they did well, um, looking at their performances maybe in isolation to see if there's anything like tweak wise, tactically or, or coaching wise, things that we can do to maybe get the best out of them. And then hopefully that would improve things going forward. But obviously, um, we don't really know what's going to happen with the season. So this could well be planning for next season or sure. you know, planning for the next eight games. Yeah. And how often are you in touch with the players? Uh, we have, um, like we do daily videos. Not everyone, just one person a day puts something on. Um, the contact I have with them is, we're not always in contact with each other. I'll call your once and a few messages, things like that. But, Within the like the team, uh, they're, they're everyone's in contact as such, and um, yeah, we've got Chelsea who does like buddy systems, so we can make sure that we're communicating with everybody. And yeah, there's there's constant information from say Maggie or or, or Lynn or yourselves or, or or me if needed. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I've seen a few quiz nights going on as well. Yeah, yeah, we do the quiz every Monday. Um, there's like Annie, one of the players, does her own like fitness sessions, so it's like a communal thing. And um, uh, Gail does the yoga, so occasionally, you know, players can join in with that. So there's a lot of opportunities for players to obviously just kind of see each other. Yeah, and what's what's the mood like in the in the camp? It, it must be tough for the guys. They've all gone home right that most of them are with uh, parents or family yeah a few are a few aren't um players like emma she's she's still in lewis and emily's still in lewis um so there's a few that have gone home a few, a few that that haven't um on the whole i think everyone's okay um as well as can be um obviously players like boz are still still working 
which is um and stuff like that so yeah it's um so far so good i'd say right yeah great um well hey does anyone have any um any questions for for Simon? yeah um simon is paul hayward from the telegraph court uh, here um i was just wondering whether uh lewis women have started to think that playing again is any kind of possibility or, or do you have to kind of shut down that expectation the whole time do they do they keep that hope alive that you know the next game might not be months and months away um yeah i think um the players are, we'll, we'll have the um the notice beforehand so they'll be able to get themselves mentally prepared but i think that everyone's aware that there's a chance that we could um yeah so I mean, the way that with the National League, when it got cancelled, I guess that means there's no relegation. So I guess there's no pressure, no matter what happens. So if, you know, from my point of view, if we end up playing, it's, it's just an opportunity for us to work on a few things, almost like an extended pre-season. Um, so I think, um, I think the players essentially are, they're aware that we might be back, but, and they, they know that they will get notice. Given that... Um... Brighton players have started going back into the training ground. I mean, in, in small groups and in very controlled circumstances. Is, is there any way to start to get groups of, of your players in, perhaps on the you know on the all weather pitch across the road, or is, is there any way that you can get them together at this point? Uh, at this point, I probably would say no. I think because well, obviously quite a few are all over the place at the moment. Um, I think it's. Well, possibly uh, Roger might know a little bit more than I do about this, but um, I think as long as everyone feels comfortable and, and it's safe to do so, then it's a difficult to with the players, I guess. It's a difficult one. Um, as a club, we on the board, you know, we're looking at everything every day of the week. I'm sure everybody is actually. Um, but uh, yeah, the expectation is that things will probably, will probably have more visibility. Um, at the near term, I saw um, I saw Boris's comments uh, today, um, but there's there's a there's a lot involved in suddenly putting on even basic training sessions, um, and so we need to follow the, the guidance, the government guidance, which we'd always abide by. But also then uh, there's there's the factor of uh, other resources like testing and support and, and so on. And we, you know clearly we don't have the resources of say a, a Brighton. Um, and, and others, but yeah, we just need to see how it un un unfolds, really. I've got a question, if I could jump in, Rog. Go for it, Ash. All right, it's to you and to Simon, really. Um, and it's um, on the basis that some of us uh, firmly believe that we won't see any more football from this season because it's likely to encroach into next season. Um, if, if we do do that, and it's very unlikely we're going to see crowds uh, at matches, even if they are played, they're likely to be behind closed doors. But given, um, given the likely impact, and we've seen filed, AFC filed uh, this week announced the closure of their women's team, do we think between ourselves that there's likely to be more of that kind of movement? Do we think that some of the, some of the clubs might, when looking at costs, look to close down their women's teams not Lewis obviously I'm, I'm pretty sure pretty safe in the, in the knowledge that we're, we're looking after our women's team um, as we always have done following last night's meeting with, with the men's side as well but do, do we think there's going to be quite a restructuring ahead for the top two teams do we expect to see a lot of team movement uh, Roger do you want to go on that or me oh you go first yeah yeah I um, I do fear that maybe there could be some casualties, um, unfortunately. And did you say something about the uh, the teams in Tier 2 or Tier 1? I'm not sure. Well, 1 and 2, really. Um, we, we know that there are a couple of teams in our division that are pretty much ready to go if required. They've got the, they probably meet all the criteria needed to go up. But it's whether one or two of the teams in the top division might not carry on at the same level and I'm just wondering if we might see some of the lower tier teams pushing to come into our division and a general restructuring it's an opportunity for the FA if they wanted to bring extra teams in um, I think we're all agreed that there's probably not quite enough teams in each of the top two divisions we'd probably like to see a few more certainly bring it up to around 
uh, 14 teams in each would be would be probably about right. Um, and it would be an opportunity for the FA to do that if, for example, they drew a line under this season. Yeah, I, I believe that um, quite possibly when we end up starting the next season, whenever that will be, that it will look very different in terms of the teams that are in the leagues. Um, obviously, we don't know if unfortunate teams might um, be a casualty to this. Um, and if they are, I know obviously at the moment there's 11 teams in our league and I know that I don't believe that's an ideal number that the FA wanted. So I, I believe anyway, the teams in tier three, by Christmas, they would have had to have put their application in if, if they have the license criteria. So obviously before all of this happened, they, the FA have no doubt already had quite a few teams that would have put an application in. So yeah, quite possibly a team from tier three, or even we know that there are ambitious teams from say tier four that have a lot of financial backing. Um, so yeah, potentially, um, I don't know what I don't know they will do. Sorry? I think that was just a bit of, bit of feedback. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so potentially it could be a com com completely different league. I, I, I personally have no information, so I have no idea if, if it will grow, if, um, if, if it's even possible that teams can jump a couple of tiers or if they'll just recruit from three. I, I have no idea, so I'm just speculating. I just feel perhaps there might be a rationalising of even the top four tiers, um, depending on dropouts. I agree with you. I think there might be some casualties. I think they actually filed who were in a pretty good position in their, in their division, um, you know, and they've gone. So if they can go, then pretty much anyone in those, you know, that top four group could, could in theory, um, could go, depending on the parent club's attitude. As I said from last night, I was really um, warmed to hear Stuart Fuller and, and Hugo as well talking very positively about uh, equality and about their commitment to both sides of the club, the men and the women. So I'm not concerned about yours per se. Just just curious as to what we might be looking at come the, come the next season. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to say from a league perspective. Um, but we're, we're in weekly calls, sometimes bi-weekly calls with the FA. And, and it's a lot to do with scenario planning. Um, but yeah, the focus is, from the FA's perspective right now, is to... Um, uh, is to keep those options open to finish the league. But I think we're, it's interesting. We're seeing different things happening with different clubs. And as I said, hopefully it doesn't affect women's football too drastically. Um, we've seen um, uh, one fold yesterday. Um, but I was also interested to see earlier in the week news of uh, Reading um, announcing that they're furloughing players and... Um, According to that story, they were the first in the Super League to furlough players, which actually was a bit of a surprise because we assumed that um, other teams had done this, you know, sooner. Um, it's so it's think, an interesting thing if, if you consider that the, 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 the league wished to press on and complete this season, then furloughing players is probably not a great idea from that point. It's technically well, looking at, yeah, up until this point, if teams have not been furloughed, then that assumes that wages are being paid. Um, without revenue uh, from from gate, uh, so it it uh, you know begs some questions about how teams are being funded. We're all funded in different ways, obviously. Um, and then yeah, when um, looking ahead, when um, should the season start again, um, then when nobody's in a furlough position anymore, according to the you know the government rules, we're back to work, and potentially we might be back to work in a situation where there's no gate, which is our uh, the lion's share of our revenue yeah, right. one last thing for me on this and I'll shut up um, uh, just on the um, on the uh, the drive by the FA um, to complete the season what do you think is driving that uh, do you think it's commitment to um, sponsors or I'm, I'm just wondering why they're so desperate to get the, the season completed because it makes a lot more sense from my view to, to just draw a line under it Get everyone safe and ready and well, and look forward to starting a new season. Honestly, couldn't say. Ash, it's um, uh, you know, we're, we're all operating in. There's different pockets, different of, pockets. of industry and football and companies, and and with and also different pockets of knowledge. Right, as week to week, we know more about this thing. <laughs> you know, looking back to what's happening in Asia and so on. Um, Yes, I mean, it's hard to say. You could say, obviously, or, or, 
one would feel what the uh, you know the Premier League what the motivation is there right um, um, but it's hard to um, compartmentalize things you've seen some of the reactions from like some of the earliest decisions that were made to um, uh, cancel seasons um, and that caused problems so um, I don't know maybe it's wise to have waited until this point um, most European <laughs> men's leagues now seem to be falling into line and calling it uh, the French, uh, the Belgian, and I think the Dutch have all called their um, top divisions now. Mm. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it'd be interesting. Um, interesting to see what happens there. Yeah, but it'll be an interesting fortnight, I think. Yeah, sure. Hi, yeah. Simon. Question mm. for Simon from Jane Roberts. Hi, Jane. Hi, hi, Simon. How are you? Okay. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Um, our, our, stri our strikers. Um, the season we're in currently, because it's obviously not 100% finished, so it should be. Um, have you got plans to um, improve our one goal a game kind of average? Um, not to put too fine a point on it, we haven't been able to hit a barn door from two yards. Um, it's just, Roger, you may laugh, but it's here on the stats. Average, average goals. Score oh, I'm match. agreeing with you. It's a great it's, it's, a, it's a good way to put it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it is. It's um, what plans have you got? Are you are you shopping currently for window shopping for a striker? <laughs> um, at the moment, no. Um, in terms of because potentially there's eight more games after the season, and um, well, that won't happen. Yeah, well, I think the the further it goes, the less likely it is, and I, I yeah. agree. Um, no. Um, Potentially, yes, I, I will be looking at what options there are, potentially. But I, I also, I think that we have underperformed. And oh, I don't yeah, necessarily, the players that we have, I don't, I don't necessarily believe they are not good enough. I believe that they're just underperformed, whether that's, you know, a, a coaching issue that we've had as well. And maybe um, we've not got the best out of them. I think there's more to come from them. So I think so. I, I agree totally with you. I mean, there's some very good strikers on the roster, but they just, as you say, I totally agree. They haven't performed at all um, in the last few, in the last nine, ten matches. Um, and and it, that's why we're, we're where we are in the league, I feel. If we'd have uh, hit the target and, and hit the back of the net a bit more, perhaps we'd be um, more likely to be up in, in fifth or sixth place than uh, down in ninth. I agree. Um, yeah, we'll be... Working with ways, obviously, that we can get them better chances to score, because um, that's that's a team effort as well. Um, so it's not necessarily just down to them. The the players know as well that they they can play better and they can do better. So yeah, definitely it's something we will be looking to improve. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't necessarily mean by bringing you know new players in and, and players leaving as such. Thank you. Thank you. I had a question uh, here from, um, from um, me, Simon. Just following on from Jane's point a little bit, um, how do you kind of see the transfer market in, in the summer, um, you know, looking at the effect of the, the coronavirus outbreak, um, you know, from, from your position when Jane talks about, you know, potentially looking at goal scorers there. Um, historically, good goal scorers generally, you know, they cost money or, you know, decent contracts. Um, but do you kind of see that, you know, it, it could benefit yourselves in, in terms of, you know, maybe the better players, you know, might not be as expensive to, to keep as they once were? Or, you know, is, is it a case that, you know, that there's going to be less money, you know, in your budget to work with and it might be more difficult to get, um, you know, attacking players into the club? Yeah, I mean, um, the board will give me a budget and um, I'll then work to that. At the moment, like, as you say, with everything that's kind of going on at the moment, it's very hard to to know what that budget is. So that's something that will happen a little bit further down the line. And maybe when the league give us some sort of clarity about what's happening, it'd be easier to plan in for that. Because, you know, if we go back, we've got eight more games without revenue. If it's all behind the closed door, that could affect the budget. So I guess there's a lot of unknowns at the moment. But whatever that budget is, I will obviously work to it. Um, will it make players more let's say cheaper or, or more affordable um i'm not sure um in terms of contracts it's it's very unlikely that you're going to get someone for less than what they're on and i believe well if you've got a player on a deal 
it's, you can't really offer them less <laughs> as such. So um, it, it might not necessarily make um, you know uh, players more affordable, shall we say? Yeah, I mean, just that point is, um, you know, is is the value of football maybe going to drop a little bit? You know, when you say that um, you know you can't offer players a lesser deal. Um, is it going to be that some players, you know, if they're out of contract and haven't got a club and they're desperate to, you know, to get a club and, and get, get some income coming in, um, you know, have, have players maybe got to drop the demands a little bit next year, um, depending, you know, on the, the financial situation, um, you know, and, and obviously how many clubs come through with this? Yeah, yeah, that could, could be possible, especially, so, for example, if, like, we can only offer what we have, so if I put that offer to a player, they can either accept it or not. And that might mean that they potentially take an offer and that could be anywhere. That is less than maybe what they, they would like. Um, so yeah, potentially. I think from our perspective, uh, club wide, it's, um, we, we don't know really, it's a, there's a market, you know, the market will decide. We don't know really what the market is, is going to be like until, um, you know, this begins to settle down and, we're likely to um, be looking at a new type of football, you know, maybe behind closed doors. Financially, what does that mean? There's lots of unanswered questions that we've got to work through. Um, we should affect the market for everything. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, I had a, a I had question a, uh, here from uh, Natasha, if I could put it to you, Si. Um, this is on the chat. Um, she asks, uh, are you offering any psychological support to your players to support them during this time? Um, and to help them come back onto the pitch. Yeah, we have um, Chelsea, who's a psychologist. So she she is um, she's there for any player that wishes to speak or, or anything along those lines. She's also recently just um, kind of sent out another like survey for the players, so, um, for them to kind of fill in if they've got any you know issues or anxieties or any kind of you know concerns, um, and then when we get that kind of feedback, um, we can then look to help players where we can, like depending on what their anxiety or what their concern might be. Um, it might be signposting onto the, the right um, organizations that can help. It might be, you know, um, you know, whatever it is, but yeah, there's, there's a contact that's happening that will allow us to know um, potential issues. <laughs> Um, I had another question. Oh, Rodney, you wanted to ask Simon something. Yeah, hi Simon, it's Rodney here. Um, going back to the point that Jane made about the goal scored, um, I wanted to know what or how you're going to go about improving the players uh, if you believe they've underperformed or uh, in short, is there a special book you're reading which is giving you top tips to do this? No, I think um, I think you can see from our first game of the season, let's say uh, some players, for example, they were quite full of confidence. We had a good pre-season, um, scoring goals, very, very confident. Obviously, that kind of went into the Blackburn game. Even when we didn't play particularly well, there was a confidence, say, for example, for Emma to get the ball from inside her half, drive 20, 30 yards and shoot from distance. Um, that confidence left, you know, and that happened to a lot of players. And potentially the, the run of games does that and the results... Um, so they were just all low on confidence. So potentially one way is obviously trying to find a way to get that confidence back. Um, and I think then you'll see a slightly different player from, from a lot of the players as a collective. Um, like I said, when I go back and I'm reviewing the players individually, there will be things that we can do to tweak certain things that we do that can get the best out of them. So, you know, it might not be related to us here, but, you know, we can isolate a player that needs players around them to be able to combine. And then it's just about getting players closer. And that might be changing slightly the team shape, the way that we play, or just looking, maybe we play the ball too slow at times. And actually we need to be a little bit more vertical with our play or direct. So there's, there's tactical tweaks that we can do to hopefully get the best out of the players. Um, and, and again, I think just a major part is confidence. And so instilling, installing a bit of that confidence or belief in them and potentially that, that can happen after a transfer window. Um, because, yeah, if, you, if you're offering them a contract, you're believing in them and, you're, you know, we're, we're backing them. So hopefully, yeah, I, be, I believe in them and I believe that we can turn it around. 
Uh, Alison had a question as well in similar vein about um, what positives could be taken from this time. Alison, do you, do you want to expand on that? Or? Hi, Simon. Evening, Hello. everyone. Yeah, Evening. I mean, obviously, uh, we're all very, very aware that this is a very serious and difficult time. I suppose I was just look, thinking equally, um, you know, how, what positives can we look at from this pause and from this moment of reflection, which Simon, you're alluding to in terms of, you know, it's brilliant re reflection time in terms of being able to do all that reviewing. You know, what other positives do you think this very unprecedented time that obviously none of us would want, but it's here, might we be able to take into um, the performance and the game going forward from this kind of moment of pause? If that makes sense. Um, so the, the, the positives this break has given us? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess um, it's going to help with a lot of players that were suffering either from fatigue or mental stress as well with, um, you know, some of them were studying at university, doing courses and stuff like that. So potentially it's giving them a break, which is it's good for freshening, you know, sometimes. Um, although it's probably come with other stresses. <laughs> so the mental fatigue might be there in a different way um and also it's, it's allowed them to maybe take a step back review their performances um and kind of like see the areas maybe where they're going wrong ask additional questions um and just hopefully give them a bit of clarity about their own performances so uh, yeah there's positives from the football side and say like personal positives for me obviously just time to, to be with family and stuff and potentially a few of them can do that and that can also do wonders sometimes. And all the individually um, sort of seeing this as a really good time to work on their confidence and some of that kind of mental training into mental performance because when they're in they're in season it's so hectic isn't it it's it's a very kind of straight in straight in straight in and it's difficult to take in anything else so you know, are some of them starting to think, actually, this is a fantastic time for me to really to think about my own confidence and how I can turn that into uh, a different part of my performance when we come back on the grass? Potentially, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hopefully, yeah. <laughs> There's lots of different characters, aren't there? It's quite funny. I was chatting to, uh, I did a podcast with Caitlin and Rianne probably about two weeks into um, lockdown. I think it was just isolation then, and uh, Caitlin was hilarious. Uh, she was already going you know, going up the wall. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. They definitely. Um, I guess they're refinding their love for it as well. They're like, you know, really enthused to get back out. So that's that's a positive. Huge so. positive. Yeah, that's exciting. Thank you. Yeah, that was sort of what I was wondering really. Yeah, thank you. I'm going back on mute now. Okay. That's <laughs> Uh, Ash, Ash had a question about the pathway, and there's been some chatter on the um, on the messaging here. Is there anything else you wanted to ask on that one, Ash? Uh, not really, um, Rog. Um, I was just I, I saw the ad going out, and I just want, wondered if there was any major changes um, from the coaching staff that we had, or if we're just looking to increase uh, the, the sort of coverage. The yeah. age groups. Um, yes, I can have first. Here is there anyone else who's um, tuning in? We're hiring for pathway coaches across the board um, on the women's side, uh, like right across the age groups, really. So, yeah, that's um, we're bolstering really and maybe tweaking a, a few things. Um, it, as always, um, people d do come and go at, at particularly at the, uh, at the lower age levels. Um, <clears throat> a lot of that's voluntary, so um. But yeah, um, we're looking to bolster uh, things and, and 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 really get more organised and do a much better job of it. Um, Alison here is very involved in in that, so um, that that'll take shape when we when we get back to normal. And then that would um, sort of along the lines of when the pathway was first set up. Um, it felt like we kind of disconnected from the pathway a little bit, um, probably a season or so ago. But that seems to be is that connection between the first team down through the FS and the DS, the FS, and then the, the, the junior ranks, is that you're looking to strengthen that and to, to improve the communication flow? I guess that's for Alison as much as, uh, yeah. as for anyone. Alison? 
Um, hi, Ash. Yeah, very much so. Um, I'm new to Lewis, um, and the plan is to really start to build a cohesion um, from top to bottom. So uh, 14's obviously started last year. Um, in time, and I mean in time, we can't do this immediately, but it'd be, it would be good to bring in possibly a younger age group when we really get established, but that's not in the near future. Um, so really the, the key focus is for the 14s, 16s, 18s, into the DS and up to Simon to be linking up. Now what that actually means in reality is um, Simon and I have been having a few chats and, it, and it's looking at, you know, what, what his concepts and principles of, of play are at the first team that then can be um, made age appropriate and aligned for some of the younger ones coming up. Um, so that when we do start to get the players who are moving through, hopefully we're nurturing some really strong technical players. Um, with hopefully bringing in some futsal to really help help with that with 1v1 battles and good on left and right, expressive, creative, but also who um, Simon obviously will be best to, to speak this, but you know, he, he's looking for players who are incredibly adaptable. So through the younger age groups are starting to actually get them used to, to um, different formations, different systems, and being able to turn their hand to playing uh, in lots of different ways so that when they come up to Simon, hopefully we've got some critical thinkers, we've got some people who can problem set and solve and outwit our opponents uh, at, at the mind level as well as at the feet level. So yeah, quite a lot of work on cohesion and um, really starting to bring a philosophy through hmm. from Simon down, yeah. But it will take a bit of time, there's quite a lot of work sure. to do that, it won't be overnight. There's, there is a fundamental issue which is probably unique to women's football in, when compared to at Lewis to the men's side, which is that unfortunately all the teams end up playing within a very short period of time from each other on a Sunday, which tends to mean that the manager of in Simon's position doesn't get much chance to watch the DS or the FS actually play. So he's relying on information being fed. And I think they're the channels that probably need as much work as any really is to is to just give Simon a, an image and a picture of, of the sort of players that are coming through because he's very unlikely to see them playing in a match situation because he's prepping for for first team football. Simon do you want to jump in on that? Yeah I mean um, the DS have been starting to film their games so I should have access to that and hopefully you know hopefully we'll be able to get footage of, of all of those games but also for tra training um, like Lewis from the DS has been sending me the players when I ask them, like say, in the back or this kind of position, but also with Kelly. So I've been having contact with Kelly and she's been able to send me promising FS players um, who have actually been doing really, really well. So I'm lucky enough to get that contact with some of those players. So, you know, within the first in training sessions, there are, you know, the FS players and the DS players that join in. Great. Thank you. Right. I've got a question here from Carl, um, who's on the line, but is um, out and about. So um, probably got wind and interference on the, on the line there. So I'll ask this one for Carl. Uh, so sorry, Carl says um, he's been involved in the women's game at tier two and three level f for, uh, for four years now. Uh, his question is, how does tier two um, start operating full time? Should it be FA led or supported or club driven? Um, and in his his perspective, there's uh, big gaps between each league at tier one to four. Um, so yeah, question is like, what, what what in your mind is like the trigger? How do we go from uh, tier two? How do we go from where we are to full time? Uh, funding would probably help. I mean, it's it's expensive, um, and there's not a lot in. So I mean, you can maybe get sponsorship yourself, or you can get, but there's not necessarily. A lot of prize money or anything like that like i'm not sure in the super league i think you, you get a certain amount for where you finish or something along those lines you don't get anything from that as far as i'm aware in the championship um and so the only real prize money you can get is obviously from the fa cup and we're all aware about the the sums that are involved with that um so sometimes it, it does become incredibly difficult to have that extra outlay and you're not really financially going to get anything back to even break even um so i think yeah, potentially the funding that can come through or whether it's, I don't know, league sponsors 
push it more or something along those lines would help. Um, another idea that I heard someone say was, uh, let's say there were some casualties, unfortunately. Say it was a 20 team league, just WSL all together. Obviously there's a big disparity in quality. Um, but if you're playing each week against um, a decent side, like say Arsenal, Chelsea, City, you're going to get good gates. You're going to, you know, so potentially also you might have a more of an opportunity to loan in some of those very good, talented young players because they're going to be playing against top opposition every week. So you might reduce the golf eventually. And also because it's responsibly, because you get a little bit more funding, a little bit more finance, um, you might be more, it might be easier for your club to also invest themselves and go full time because there's more chance of attracting sponsorship and also getting some sort of finances back because it is it is very very expensive i mean in terms of the, the disparity in in say tier three and four of the quality sometimes that's just because teams have been in that league for a long time and they never seem to get relegated like i know from when i was in tier four we were better than a lot of teams in tier three but because a team would drop out they never got relegated or only one could go up so it, you know, it, it's hard to get promoted as such and get into a league. And because the leagues have been so long the way that they are, you've got teams that just aren't good enough. So, yeah, that's that's that really. Thank you, sorry. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I, James, I've got one. If, yeah. Go, Jane. Go for um, it. How much influence uh, has RAF been um, having to the team, the club, and uh, has she been attending many training sessions or matches? To Roger or, or myself? Whoever can answer it, I have. Or both. Um, I've, um, I'm going to meet her soon, but I've, I've not met um, Claire yet. So she's not been at any, any training sessions. Right. So I think she's more, more involved behind the scenes than, mm -hmm. than um, yeah, than, than okay. in terms of coaching or, or anything like that. And another one, similarly, um, Roger might want to answer this. Um, do you think the current transactional model is more successful than the old building model of the past? And, and why do you think the current transactional model at the club is, is, is better, if it is? What, what, just to clarify, Jane, by transactional, you mean um, with in, players, in players coming in? And ev ev everyone changed and a whole new broom and everything, really? From the from which side of the club? From the playing side or the board? From the, from the um from the off pitch side more than the playing side. Right, right. Um, gosh, um, yeah, I'm 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 not quite sure what you mean by sort of transactional, but um, you know, there's always an ebb and flow with the board, um, which essentially renews itself every year, <clears throat> and we all have you know tenure on the board. Um, three years. Um, some people stay longer for the you know, term of uh, like four cycles of uh, three years. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, from and I've come and gone in the, in, in the past. Um, I think generally, from, from my perspective, it's usually something which is th there's a core which continues, and then mm -hmm. there's um, uh, uh, and, and 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 other positions change. Um, I, th I think we're always striving to get it right it's a difficult one for us where um, we want to be as professional as possible and the, the women's side of the club has advanced that tremendously particularly in the last 18 months um, and at the same time uh, we're very you know we're a community club so we're very led by volunteers and our owners and and, and so on who work on behalf of the club I'm a volunteer uh, as well and getting the balance right is is uh, difficult I don't think we've got it right um, but I think we, we're probably getting in the right direction where we've got a good balance between mm -hmm. back office team who are salaried and paid and we've got some phenomenal people there uh, the likes of Maggie Murphy and Lynn and, and, and so on um, and having the right mix of people on the board who are able to to do good things and also work with all the great you know, we have hundreds of volunteers as well. So we're, we're probably more in better shape, I think, than we were, I, pers my personal view, looking back maybe three or four years ago. And of course, Is you've it, got no Duncan now. So, I mean, have you had to advertise for a new Duncan or? Well, actually, we've got Duncan uh, Redux. So Duncan is, um, is, is continuing. 
So oh. at one point, yeah, which is great news. We're all delighted. Um, for those who don't know, Duncan is our um, operations manager. He basically keeps the ground running and he's a terrific guy, lives locally. Um, so yeah, he was planning to retire, but um, his plans have changed. So um, thankfully, um, here we carry on, yeah. Okay, thank you. Good news. Just one more from uh, me, Simon, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, hopefully we look forward to August and social distancing um, rules may have relaxed a little bit, fingers crossed, and hopefully this horrible virus has moved on. Um, I know that in the current campaign, there's been some managers who've maybe criticised the, the calendar, particularly for women's championship clubs. Obviously, you operate part-time. Um, a lot of midweek travelling for, for cup games has been mentioned. Um, you know, if, if we have got fans back in stadiums during next season, is there anything which can be done you know, with the calendar to, to kind of benefit championship clubs a little bit and, you know, make it a little bit easier in terms of, of travelling. Um, I'm particularly thinking, you know, it's, it's quite a southern division, um, which isn't so bad for yourselves, but, you know, the likes of Durham and Blackburn have, have a lot of long trips. Yeah, I mean, um, I think, I'm trying, my memory is terrible. I, I think uh, we've only had one one midweek, I think, which was, no, no, we had a couple. Yeah, we had West Ham and, uh, um, yeah, Tottenham. I think, yeah, there's a lot of free weekends sometimes. And I know that when we were looking at some of the rescheduled games, I think with London City, I think they had like one game in like a month or something. It's just how it ended up going. So I'm not sure if that's because there's 11 teams that that's given that free week every kind of week for a team. But... Um, yeah, ultimately, when you are a part-time league, I know that some people have said with the Conti Cup, when you have to go midweek, it's better if it's always the Super League club that has to travel away because obviously they're full-time, they can do that during the day as opposed to a championship club who's got players that are working. And then obviously you finish and you've got to get from, say, working in Lewis all the way to, say, West Ham. I mean, when we did it, the Dartford Tunnel was, was shut because of an accident. So I think we got there like 15 minutes before kickoff and then we had an injury. So, Sorry. Um, yeah, so I think potentially like little changes like that. So maybe the Super League clubs are the ones that travel. And also that's good for the gate receipt as well, for the home club. Um, and maybe, I mean, the stuff like the storms are sometimes things that you can't really change with the, the cancellations, but maybe overload the front end of the calendar. So when the weather's nicer and then obviously you've got those free weekends to put the fixtures on. I know that you know, it potentially would have been quite difficult to get a few games in and we would have been playing midweeks. So, yeah, potentially, yeah, we can fit them in more at the start of the league. But, yeah, sorry. I, I, I have a view on that too. Um, I, I think not necessarily to do with like fixture, um, the mechanics of the fixture scheduling, but um, what, what we're striving for is at Lewis is to, um, is to create the habit. If I think of this from a fan perspective, and for us, that's important. It's, it's revenue, but we, you know, we care about the fans and a, and a great day out. And it generally is. And we've seen the gates go really well this year. Um, we're not yet at the point where women's football is just a, you know, a weekend habit and in the same way that uh, the men's game is. And so anything and everything that we can do to make that so um, will be great. Um, because what that means is people, people will return and, and, the, and the gates will just grow and the support uh, will grow with it as it just becomes like a normal uh, way of life. So, um, yeah, with, with, we price our games the same. We'd, we're not running special offers where it's like a fun day out for free that, you know, skews the numbers. We, we want to just make this like a, a, a habit and a, um, yeah, a regular part of the, of the family's um, weekend. And, and I think through doing that, um, the, 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 the gates will grow and the, and the game will just, um, uh, you know, move on, kick on. Any other questions? Yeah, hi. Sorry, Ollie here from the 52 blog. Thanks for arranging this evening. Um, Simon, a question for you, really. Would you prefer the uh, the season to be played so that you could have got a bit of free hit? Or would you rather just sort of call a, call a day on it and, and then you can look forward to the start of a new season when, whenever that does begin? Um, I think it really depends on the time in that we come back. Um, so... I personally would just like clarity. <laughs> Either way would be nice. But um, let's say, for example, 
they say, yeah, we're going to try and finish the league. But let's say that we can't come back until September regardless. If we're coming back in September and we finish off this league and then we start the new league really late, I would then just prefer to start because I just prefer that. Um, but if, say, the league, the league finishing doesn't change the start date of next season, then I, I like you say, it's a free hit. It's an extended preseason against good teams. Um, so really, a long-winded answer, really does depend when the return date is as to whether I would prefer the, the finish the season or go straight into the, second, the next. And to follow up on that, I suppose it's probably hard for you to answer, but do you have an idea of what the players' answer to that would be? Would I suppose a pretty similar, similar one to yours, is it? Um, potentially. I haven't spoke to every single one of them about this. I know that from conversations I've had with them or with some players, they kind of just want clarity. And the, the longer this draws on, they kind of just think, let's just like call it as such. So I think, um, yeah, I think that's probably, well, that's the, the feeling I'm getting from the players I've spoke to so far about it. Yeah, thank you. It's, and it's a tough one for the players too, um, because at this level, most of them will have second jobs as well. So, um, you know, it's like there's a whole lot of life, which is um, on pause right now. And everything needs to slot together well for them to, you know, they work incredibly hard to be able to train well and play well in amongst their, you know, other, other lives. Um, so it's a tricky one. I'm sure everyone just wants clarity so we can crack on. I've got a, a question, if that's okay. Um, you, Simon, you talked, uh, we talked earlier about the pathway and, and developing your uh, footballing philosophy and style up through the, the, up through the ranks, as it were, so that players are, to coin a prime minister's phrase, oven ready when they, when they get their chance to come to the first team. Um, just, just give us a, just an overview of what your style is, how you like to play football. And as a part two to that question, um, I asked the same thing of Hugo last night, and I was interested to know your view, how you view pre-season, what you, what you look for in a pre-season. I mean, some managers go from wanting to win every game heavily to having tough games to having a mixture. So two-part question, really, playing style and then pre-season. Yeah, I mean, so playing style, I like... I, I do take in consideration the, the opposition. Um, I like my, my team ideally to be organized. Like, so defensively organized, defensively organized, everything. So that doesn't just mean defensively, you know, that we just sit back and everything. I, I liked us to be good on the ball as well. So, you know, there are concepts that we have, which are similar to France in certain ways. Um, so essentially if we have the ball, obviously we're going to look to play. And for example, we, when we played Arsenal, we still tried to play. But obviously, I don't want us to overplay, and there's, there's learning that we need to do with that. But ultimately, the way we build up, I want us to be organised, and I want us to obviously, the way we do this will have an an, an impact on the team that we're playing. So that's why when um, Alison was speaking about the, the youth players needing to know different formations, I would like our players to know different formations because. There are certain systems that you can play, and although it's very fluid and, and players will interchange and all that kind of stuff, it's good for them to understand this. So, you know, essentially, I guess, if I'm going a long way around this, my philosophy, I'd, I'd like players to be organised. We have to be adaptive to the situations. Um, and, yeah, that, that's basically, I mean, I've got a, a game model that the players will follow, and then we have the concepts and stuff. Um, so hopefully when you see us play, you'll be able to understand what we're trying to do. Um, and then in regards to pre-season, I like to have a mix. So, for example, you, if you just have easy games or, or tough games, for example, it can affect the confidence as well. So you're not going to be ready for the season if you've just played against a lot of lower tier teams as such. So I think it's nice to have that little blend. And I guess my idea would be a couple of, let's say, lower ranked teams shall we say where hopefully you can get those positive results and get a bit of confidence and then you you up the challenge and then hopefully you know go against teams that are ranked higher than you and then and then drop off a little so that you you enter the season confident that that would be my my perfect kind of curve as such thanks <clears throat> just a, just as a follow-up on the on the playing style side um something that those of us who followed the club for a long time 
have noticed is um, the team, the team, the way it's set up, specifically through the midfield. Historically, we've always had what we like to term the warrior player. Now, you could argue that we've got one now in Caitlin Hayes. She's, uh, she's as close to a warrior as, as you'd wish to have in the side, although she's um, pretty much a centre-back. Um, but um, we, we don't seem to have that sort of midfield enforcer, what I like to call the Roy Keane-type player, who maybe goes in there and mixes it up when we haven't got the ball. Um, is it a deliberate ploy not to have a player like that, or is it just a, a, a case of sharing the duties amongst the midfield players? Um, I think, well, I don't know really. Um, I mean, it's it's not obviously the players that I, I inherited are the players that are there, and um, potentially, for example, let's say in this, the midfield where we've been playing, Phil, Danny, Ellie, Ava had had some games there. I guess none of them you would say are that kind of enforcer. So it's, I guess it's just adapted with the players that we have available to us. So if, if the question then goes on, will I be looking to bring in a player that's like that? Again, again it, it really does depend on, you know, um, a lot of factors, essentially, who, who we're looking to ideally keep and also who potentially is available. But I, I'm really happy with the midfielders that we have. And like you said, there's other players in the team that like Caitlin and there's other players that show, you know, similar qualities, maybe in a different way that... Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like an obvious leader um, role, I guess. And Caitlin, certainly, you're right. She absolutely, specifically, I'm thinking about Arsenal, um, you know, and she was just absolutely immense. Um, but, um, and, and it's also fair to say, to, to sort of attack my own question in a way, that the level of football and the style of football we're playing uh, in the championship doesn't always merit that. There are some teams, um, they're not too far up the uh, M23 from us, uh, who, who are a little more physical um, in their approach. But generally speaking, we do tend to come up against more footballing sides. So perhaps there's not quite that need that there used to be at a slightly lower level when it got a bit more agricultural more often on the pitch. So I guess I'm kind of answering my own question. It was just a... It's just it's the way the team's developed. And actually, we've got a lot more footballers in the team now than we used to have in terms of abilities of individuals on the ball and, and, and quality of possession. So that, that, that side of things has definitely stepped up. It's just those old lags who've been watching for a few years kind of miss the, the sort of, um, the, sort of the, the gnashing of teeth and the bulging of eyes sometimes that used to sort of drag the team forward when we were having a rough spell. Yeah, I mean, if you, I think we definitely, and hopefully, we've still got a very young team as well. So they're, they're growing into it as one. A lot of the players haven't actually played at this level before. So those kind of natural leaders, you know, you know, like you say, maybe Caitlin shows it in certain um, actions that she has. Potentially, those younger ones are starting to develop that and grow into that. So hopefully, we'll have a few more leaders as such. Thank you. Okay, guys, a um, couple of minutes left. Um, any last questions for Simon? I, I, if that's okay, Jane's got one. Um, Go I it. presume, so, well, Simon and Roger, actually, the dream is to get to the, the promised land in Tier 1. And what sort of time scale I, would you expect um, to look to get to Tier 1? And um, how would the budget? I mean, obviously, it's uh, huge um, to, be, to be a Tier 1 club. Um, for, for, for me, I, I, every game we play, I'd like to be competitive. I honestly do believe, like, I, I maybe I'm crazy, but I believe we can beat anybody. Like, each game, we go into the Arsenal game, for example, and we believe that we can beat them, as crazy as that sounds, because we know if we are organised and we do things well, then, then there's always a chance. So every single game we play, we believe that we can get a result and we can, we can win. There's, there's no reason we shouldn't. Um, does that mean, for example, next season I'm saying we're going to compete for the league? What that means is each game want to be competitive. I mean, the ambition of the club, from what I know is, and what I believe is, is that, yes, we want to be in the Super League and we want to get there as, as soon as we can. But we're also aware that that's not an overnight thing. So, you know, for me, it's, it's game by game. Be as competitive as we can be. Um, I mean, Roger, you might have different thoughts on this, but yeah. 
No, we want, we want to be there as quickly as possible. And um, it's, it's, it's not beyond the realms of possibility quickly either. Um, if you look at the league as it is and, and is likely to finish however it finishes this year, um, you've got a, um, a, 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 a phenomenon with the top three, four teams and, and the, the form distribution is like extreme. Um, if, if you look at how the Villas, the Sheffield United and so on, um, have competed against the rest of the league, they've, they've almost not dropped any points. Um, you know, we, we haven't performed as well as we could do uh, amongst the other part of the league. Um, and we could perform a lot better. So is it unrealistic for us to think that we could be top four, top three, you know, et cetera, uh, soon? I, 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 don't, I don't think so. Um, I think we had a particularly different, difficult um, period this year where um, you know, everything came at once in terms of the, tough, the toughest possible uh, fixtures. So the, the, the actual fixture list distribution wasn't that kind to us. Um, but yeah, are we, are we far from the top? Um, not, not so much. Could, could we get there quickly then? Um, yeah, I think um, you know, a bit of luck and, and better preparation going into the next season and why not? All righty. Any more for any more? Okay. Well, um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon, for this this evening. Um, I know you've got a lot on. Um, and uh, thanks, everybody, for, um, for being here. And thanks for your questions. Lots of um, uh, great thank stuff. You. Um, yeah, hey, maybe we'll do this again. Um, it's been Quite, quite fun. We do more of this kind of stuff. With the we get to do it again when we know what's happening with the season. So then we can yeah. get our teeth into what's coming. Yeah, totally. Um, love for that, that point to be there and have that chat. That would be great. Um, so yeah, we'll probably, um, uh, we've been taping this, so we'll probably put it up on YouTube um, tomorrow and, um, uh, and and post it on the website so that other people can see. But thanks for your questions because it's great. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, 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 Simon. Thanks, Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Interesting. Okay, guys. Thanks, Roger. Right. Cheers. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye